morning. It's good to see everybody here today. I invite you to go ahead and grab your Bibles and open them up to the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 6. Uh, this morning we'll be looking at verses uh, 10 to, to 17, uh, once again, uh, focusing mainly on verse 17 and uh, the first part of that verse. Um, we're in week four of our mini-series uh, of the armor of God uh, in, this, uh, in this epistle. Uh, we've already covered four uh, of the six pieces already uh, that we've already learned about, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, and the shield of faith. And last week, as we, we learned about the, the shield of faith, we learned uh, that it represented an act of faith and an effective faith. And so we dug into those truths a good bit last week. We learned that an act of faith means that we don't just believe in Christ for our salvation. It means that we keep on believing in Christ. We keep on trusting in Christ and, and His Word for all things. That our, we also learned that our faith is only as, a, as effective as the object of our faith. And of course, the object of a believer's faith is not just faith. We don't have faith in faith. Our faith is in Christ. And so that is where our strength comes from. And so uh, we don't uh, place our faith in little statues or, 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 or of saints. We don't put our faith in little statues of the Virgin Mary. We don't put our faith in... Uh, prayer beads or four-leaf clovers or rabbit's foots or lucky rocks or anything else. We put our faith solely in Christ. And so we also learn that having an effective faith means uh, that we have placed our faith completely in Christ and we continue to do so, that we, that we have to, uh, the power within us, that the, 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 the faith is active and the fact that it does uh, uh, allows us to uh, quench the fiery darts of the, of the enemy, the, the that this shield of faith as we possess, as we walk in these truths that we have hidden in our hearts are effective, that we uh, are able to uh, believe all that God's Word tells us and apply it to our lives instead of the lies of the wicked one. And so the key to having this shield or using this shield properly, though, is the, that we must take it up, that we must possess it, that our, if we don't do this, we leave ourselves fully exposed to all the fiery darts of the wicked one as Paul makes clear to us. So this morning we're going to spend our time learning the importance of the helmet of salvation, the next piece of the armor that we come to in our text. You see, a soldier's breastplate uh, was made to protect his vital organs. It covered his upper torso and, and mainly his heart is really what you're looking at protecting and the lungs and all those uh, vital organs in the upper chest cavity. It covered all of the vital organs, all but one, and that's why the soldier needed this helmet, right? The helmet was designed to protect the, the soldier's head, to protect his brain. And, and with Paul's day and what he's thinking about here, uh, there was likely two main uh, types of helmets, two styles, I guess you could say, in the first century. One was made of a, a thick leather uh, and, and would have uh, plates of metal attached to it. It was kind of a, a, a cheaper version or, or more common, I guess, a less costly uh, uh, type of a helmet, but the, the really, really good ones and the ones that most of us are more familiar with just by looking at history books or watching movies that have uh, your uh, gladiators and whatnot in are, are these ones that were made out of a, a solid piece of, of, of iron or, or, or bronze. And, and, and those were the ones that we think about here. It's, they were much better uh, for the, the heavier weapons in combat with the uh, battle axes and the broadswords or the maces or whatever could they could withstand those type of blows. The leather one could not. It would just split like a hot knife going through butter. And so they didn't offer much protection. Whereas these heavier ones, these thicker ones were are much more stronger. And so uh, they were heavier, of course. So there is a trade-off to having a, a better helmet, a stronger helmet. It was much heavier. They would be lined with pieces of sponge. Not sponge like we're thinking about, like you wash dishes with, uh, uh, organic sponge that they would line them with uh, to make them a little more barrel, but it, but it wasn't about comfort. They, you know, in those days, you think about in battle, being alive is much more important than being comfortable, right? And so that's what they're thinking about. This, this helmet would help them to stay alive. And so uh, it's this heavier type of helmet, I believe, that Paul was envisioning as depicting the helmet of salvation. And of course, like a real helmet, the helmet of salvation only does what it's intended to do if we wear it, if we have it on, right? And that only makes sense. It's as, it's as if you think about someone that rides a motorcycle. You see, it doesn't do you any good to put your helmet on after you've wrecked your motorcycle, 
right? It doesn't do you any good. It's too late. The damage is already done. That a helmet is made to prevent injuries, not to treat injuries. And so I believe the helmet of salvation is, like the shield of faith, 100% effective when we use it, right? But we must use it. We must put it on and keep it on. You see, the, the wicked one attacks our heads with his lies and his accusations and the, the blows, they might daze us and they might even cause us to stagger a bit, but they won't be able to penetrate and do any real damage. They'll just bounce right off when we have on our helmet of salvation. And so I've been using the example of Jesus over and over again because He is our example for everything and all things. And I've been using His example of His temptation in the wilderness is, uh, here a lot lately because, well, He demonstrates what life should look like for a believer. The, the way the armor of God is supposed to work. It's, it's supposed to do like this, like act like Jesus did and respond like He did. That nothing the devil ever said or did ever phased Jesus one bit. Not one bit did it bother Jesus. And that everything that, that the devil said or did just bounced right off of Him like bullets off of Superman. And Jesus even at one point would uh, went on the offensive with the sword of the Spirit, which we'll learn about next week so i've referenced it often in this series so let's take a few minutes to to actually read it for ourselves and we'll look at it from luke's gospel instead of matthew's gospel and in luke uh, chapter 4 verses 1 to 13 it says this then jesus being filled with the holy spirit returned from the jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness being tempted 40 days by the devil and in those days he ate nothing and afterward when they had ended he was hungry and the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone and jesus answered and said to him it has been said you shall not tempt the lord your god and now when the devil had ended every temptation he departed from him until an opportune time i know what some of you might be thinking right now because i've had the same thoughts before of course jesus can resist the devil right of course he can well, i mean he's jesus He's God in the flesh. He's the Son of God. Of course, He can resist the devil. He's God and we're not. We can't do the things that Jesus did. We're not God. That's true. I will not argue that. But if you're a believer, you are filled with the Spirit of God. And that's as close as you can get. That's pretty powerful in itself. We're not God, but if we are born again believers, we are filled with the Spirit of God. 1 John 4.4 4 tells us that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Matthew 19.26 tells us that with God all things are possible. Romans 8.37 says that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And even as Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, He made this promise to His disciples and of course by application to us as well, all future disciples. John 14.12, Jesus said this, He who believes in Me the works that I do, He will do also, and greater works than these will He do, because I go to my Father. You see, in Christ, we're more powerful and capable of doing far more than we can possibly imagine. You see, we're nobody's victim. Nobody's victim. We are conquerors. We're overcomers. That James 4.2 says that you do not have because you do not ask. And we can take that same truth and apply it to the armor of God. Think of it this way. You do not have what the armor of God provides because you do not put on and take up the armor of God that God has provided for you to wear. You see, we're missing out on these things, these blessings, these 
protections because we're not making use of the armor of God that He has provided for us. Does that make sense? It should. If it doesn't make sense, hopefully it will by the time we get through here shortly. So go ahead and grab your Bibles if you have them and stand as we honor the reading of God's Word together. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17. The Apostle Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation. This is the Word of God. Father, we thank You for this day. Again, as already has been mentioned several times, we are thankful for the opportunity and the privilege to be able to gather in this place with your saints, with your people, with your spirit and with your word. God, we ask that you would teach us your word today, that you would use me as your mouthpiece to communicate your word to your people. And Father, I pray that where uh, correction is needed, that that would be given. Father, where encouragement needs to be given, encouragement would be given. Father, where there's uh, one or more here this morning that has not yet trusted Christ, that today might be the day of salvation in this place. God, just do your work in us. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, it goes without saying that the helmet of salvation is not a, a physical helmet. You know, it's not something that we can uh, order from Lifeway unless you're looking at maybe a, a VBS prop, like a little plastic helmet. But that's not going to do us any good. Right? We can't just... You know, we can't just order this, this, this helmet and put it on and wear it like a hat and the wicked one can't mess with our heads. That'd be kind of like thinking along the lines of, uh, you ever seen those movies where you have these people that are worried about, uh, uh, aliens, like aliens, you know, not people aliens, but aliens in space being able to read your thoughts. So they wear these tinfoil hats, you know, that we wear those so the aliens can't, you know, control their minds or read their thoughts. That's, it's not along those lines. But I wish it was that simple. I wish we could just order a, a, a physical helmet and it was the helmet of salvation. All these truths we're going to talk about today, we, we could just, you know, put it on the nightstand or maybe even sleep in it. I don't know, just to wear it all the time and all these truths would be ours. I wish it was that simple, but it's not. The helmet of salvation is a, it's a, it's a spiritual helmet. It's a, it's a metaphor is what Paul is using here. It's something that we must wear in a spiritual sense that it's formed uh, by our knowledge and our understanding of God and His Word, it's the the, the more that we mu- the more that we know, the more that we understand, the more that we grow uh, in our knowledge and understanding of Him, the stronger this helmet is, the 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 thicker it is, and and the more durable and more reliable it becomes. It will, it will be like the helmet that's made of a solid piece of bronze or iron instead of the the leather one. You see, the Bible makes it perfectly clear that the only way for us to ever overcome darkness is with light, right? That's the only way that you can do that. The only way to overcome evil is with good. And the only way to overcome the lies of the wicked one is with the truth of the Holy One. That's why we must know the Word of God. We must continue to, to understand and grow in our knowledge and understanding of the Word. And of course, the greatest truth that a believer can possess is the truth of their salvation. And because it is the, the greatest truth, the greatest possession that we have, it, it can either be used as a, our greatest strength or our greatest weakness if we don't understand it rightly and biblically, that the, the enemy can use it against us. And even if you're saved and the devil knows that you're saved, he will still do everything that he can to make you believe that you aren't saved. That the devil cannot take away your salvation, but he can certainly rob you of the joy of your salvation. And that's good enough for him. That's good enough for him. He can't take your soul, but he can take your joy. And which is why I believe Paul has, has won main purpose in mind when he said to take the helmet of salvation here in verse 17 and that one purpose is protection that's it that's what that's what a helmet does right it it protects us it it represents protection for a believer so when we talk about a helmet protecting our heads we're really talking about protecting our brains right 
or, or more specifically, we're talking about protecting our minds or even, you know, get a little more technical and a little more specific. We're talking about protecting uh, uh, what and how we think, right? Because what we know and believe about God and his word matters, right? It's incredibly important or, or what we know and believe about God uh, or, or, or what we know about who we are in Christ matters deeply. You see, we don't just love God with our heart. The Bible says that we are to love God with our mind as well, right? Love God with our with our brains, with our heads is also that the great commandment makes this clear. Matthew 22, 36 to 38 says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? This is someone asking Jesus. And Jesus answered, and Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great commandment. The first and great commandment. See, I believe when we fully grasp, we fully grasp what God in Christ has accomplished for us and in us through our salvation, we will fully grasp what it means to love God with our minds, right? With our whole minds, with the fullness of our minds. That scripture tells us to, to, to continually be renewing our minds, filling our, man, our minds with the truth of God's word. You see, that's what the helmet of salvation does. I believe the helmet of salvation protects us in two critical ways. The, the first way that the helmet of salvation protects us is from doubting our salvation. Right? That's the, that's the number one thing. Doubting our salvation. I think the, the most miserable people on the planet are people that are lost and they know they're lost. They might act like they're fine and we're having fun and we like to party and we can do whatever we want and man, life is great. But you see, Romans 1 paints a different picture. Romans 1 describes those individuals as those that God has given over to uncleanness, to vile passions, and to a debased mind. That doesn't sound like a a happy lifestyle. That sounds like a miserable individual. But you see, I would say that the second most miserable people on the planet are people that are saved, but they are constantly living with fear that they might lose their salvation. I think that's a pretty miserable lifestyle as well instead of living in the freedom of their salvation they live in fear that they might sin one too many times and god will take his salvation back let me just be clear church if it were possible for us to lose our salvation we would we would every single one of us would but the truth is this we're not saved by our good works and we're not kept saved by our good works we're saved by god's grace and we are kept saved by god's grace that's how it works that's what the Bible clearly teaches. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I love the bluntness and the clarity of how one pastor, I was, I was uh, reading some uh, uh, commentaries this week, and this is what he said about this, this the insane idea of losing your salvation. He said, absolutely no circumstance, no failure, shortcoming, or sin no matter how serious, can cause either Jesus or His Father to disown a person who is saved. Amen. Well, aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that it's not up to us, that there's, there's that we're always living in fear that, is, did I do something wrong? Did I, is He going to take this from me? Is He going to, you know, how far is too far for us to go? And I would just say, that's not just this pastor's opinion or wishful thinking. That that's what the Bible teaches. This is what the Bible says, right? And you say, well, Brother Mike, show me some scriptures. I'm glad you asked. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. You know what by no means means? It means by no means. <laughs> no exceptions. There's nothing that, that, could, that you could do that, that would cause me to cast you out. John 10, 27 to 29. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Y'all know what just was said just there? We're doubly secure. We're doubly secure in our salvation. Not only does Jesus have us, his father has us also. I'll give you one more. Romans 8. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any 
other created things shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see what the Apostle Paul just did? He just goes ahead and covers all the possible scenarios that the devil might use to get us to try to doubt our salvation. He covered them all. He covered every possible base. He says, nope, 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 not that either. Not anything. Nothing. There's nothing out there that could cause us to, to be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, the devil wants us to believe that anything and everything can cause us to lose our salvation. That's what he wants. But you see, God's word tells us that nothing can cause us to lose our salvation. Nothing. Zero. Nada. It's not possible. So let me just pause this morning and ask you this. Who are you going to believe? Who are, who are you believing today? Are you believing the devil and his lies and his deception? Or are you believing God and His Word? Of course, there are many more passages that teach us this doctrine, this beloved doctrine of eternal security, but these are the main ones that we know. And as Southern Baptists, we believe in once saved, always saved, right? We do. We, we're we proud of that. We're known for that truth. Not because that's just because, you know, what we want to be true. We believe in once saved, always saved because that's what the Bible teaches. Right? The devil is a liar. That's, that's what he does. He lies. And he loves to lie about the trustworthiness of God to keep his people saved. That the devil doesn't want us to feel secure in our salvation because he knows the, 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 the fear that insecurity creates in us. He wants us to live in fear. He wants us to live this way. He wants us to live in doubt. And Pastor John MacArthur put it this way. He said, few things are more paralyzing, unproductive, or miserable than insecurity. Than insecurity. Because you just don't know what to do. You don't know who you are. You don't know what your identity is. Am I saved or am I not saved? But Do I move forward? Do I go out and Share the gospel. Do I need to believe the gospel myself? We're confused and paralyzed. We're unproductive. But you see what this we're learning today and what we've just seen through all these verses. We can be secure in our salvation because God, God's Word tells us that we can be secure in our salvation. You see, it's not based off of how we feel. It's based off of what God's Word says. Because I can tell you, if you're like me, if you want to be honest, there are many days where I don't feel like I'm saved because I fail so miserably. It's not based off how we feel. It's based off of what God's Word says. The helmet of salvation protects us from doubting our salvation. The helmet of salvation also protects us from discouragement. Right? Protects us from discouragement. Does anybody suffer with discouragement? Is anybody discouraged today? Surely you are. There's in a room... With this many people in it, someone is bound to be discouraged. You see, another one of the devil's favorite weapons is to use discouragement against God's people. You see, if he can get us discouraged, he's got us. Right? He's got us. He's got us on the ropes. He knows he can get us to quit if he can get us discouraged. He can get us, make us give up if he can get us discouraged. When we grow overwhelmed by discouragement, that makes us want to give up because it seems that we're, everything that we're doing doesn't seem to matter, right? That's what makes us discouraged. We keep doing these things and doing all these things and nothing changes or nothing seems to be happening. That's what happens. For example, what's the point in eating right and exercising if I'm not losing any weight, right? Fitness people, dieters, y'all know what I'm talking about. You're like, what's the difference? You got people in this room that can eat whatever they want, never gain a pound. I've been eating salads for three months and lost a, a single thing. What's the point? You want to give up. Why? Because you're discouraged. You're doing everything you can to lose weight and nothing is working. What's the point in continuing to work hard and do all the right things and I still just can't seem to ever get ahead? What's the point? What's the point in continuing to pray for my husband that he would be saved? I've been praying now for 20 years and it hasn't happened yet. What's the point? You see, discouragement makes you want to quit. What's the point to continue to pray for my healing? I keep on praying. The church is praying. Everyone's praying. And guess what? My healing still hasn't come. Discouragement wants to take over and set in. You want to stop. You want to give up praying. What's the point in sharing the gospel? Nobody's responding. Right? Nobody's getting saved. What's the point? Why? Why? See, discouragement makes you want to quit. Makes you want to give up. See, it's easy to get discouraged when it seems like nothing is happening. 
It seems like you're just wasting your time. It seems like you're just wasting your life. That's really what it's about. I said, what am I doing? I got better things to do than this. This is pointless. Discouragement makes you want to give up. Of course, the Apostle Paul, of all people, had every reason to grow discouraged if anyone could. He's writing this letter from prison. Again. <laughs> Again, writing this le- a letter from prison. that Nobody suffered more than Jesus did for following Jesus. But instead of growing discouraged, Paul just saw those opportunities as opportunities to trust God more. He, he saw them as faith-building opportunities, faith-building moments, and that's what we should do also. Even though Paul's circumstances didn't always change, and they rarely did change, his attitude in those circumstances always remained the same. And what was his attitude? He was content. He was content. He understood that he was where God wanted him to be and he was doing what God wanted him to do. Philippians 4.13, that's what it's all about. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So what is the answer? All right, how, how do we deal with discouragement? What do we do when the feelings of discouragement grip us again? The answer is this. We do what the Word of God tells us to do. Right? That's what we do. We do what the Word of God tells us to do. We believe what the Word of God says. We walk by faith and not by sight like 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us to do. We do and believe what Galatians 6, 9, and 10 tells us to do and believe. Right? He says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. I'm going to add one more on here that we won't, we don't like this last one, but we need to understand it. Sometimes we just have to learn to accept that our difficult circumstances are just part of God's mysterious and perfect will for us in this season of life. Right? That He's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. That this is part of His plan. We don't understand it, but we have to trust that God is good. And it's in those hard seasons of life that we must truly believe that God's grace is sufficient. It is sufficient. It always is. And in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. If we do not give in to the attacks of discouragement from the wicked one. You see, the helmet of salvation protects us from doubt and discouragement. That's the purpose of the helmet of salvation. So this morning as we close, uh, some of y'all are aware and and some of you are excited and some of y'all are unaware and you can care less. It's football season. I I fall into that first group. I am quite excited that football is back. And so my closing illustration is appropriate. Uh, I don't know that some of y'all may know and others may not and some again don't care. But the NFL has finally come to the realization that repeated impacts to a person's head isn't good for their brain. Did y'all know that? I don't know how many years of research or how many tens of millions of dollars they had to spend to figure this out. But, uh, you know, I don't know how they're so shocked. And, of course, as players have gotten bigger, they've gotten stronger, they've gotten faster. Uh, than they were when they first started playing football back in the 1920s. Do you ever watch any footage of those early days, black and white days, and those little scrawny guys running around on the field? It's kind of it's kind of laughable. Look like a bunch of kickers nowadays. The kickers nowadays were bigger than their offensive linemen were back in those days, and so they're they're much bigger. And when they first started, you know what? They didn't even wear helmets. Then I guess they started banging heads a little bit. So they said, "We might want to put something on our heads, you know, just kind of to to soften the blow." And of course, when they first started. Uh, wearing helmets they made the the helmets were just they were made out of like kind of leather looked like a fighter pilot type deal it was kind of not much to it there was no face mask or anything like that on it but as helmets uh, got better uh, and and they 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 got better and they even decided to go ahead and uh, attach a face mask because I guess people were getting hit in the face you know getting elbowed in the face so let's protect their face don't want them getting teeth knocked out and all that stuff they put a face mask on it and so they make these helmets now just so well and so good and put his face mask on. And so what you have now is these players begin to, to launch themselves like missiles at one another, right? And, and, and that's a problem. So, and you say, well, why weren't they doing that when they didn't have helmets? Why weren't they doing when they didn't have face masks and all these good helmets? Because they didn't have confidence. They knew it, they'd hurt themselves, but now they have this 
false sense of security. They have this helmet on their heads and they think they can do anything, right? And so over the past few uh, decades, uh, several uh, prominent retired players uh, have begun reporting that they're suffering from uh, severe migraines, uh, a constant uh, ringing in their, in their ears and their heads. Uh, they, they have a, a, a progressive uh, memory loss and, they, and some of them are even, and just racked with deep, deep, deep depression. And what really got the uh, NFL's attention was a few prominent Hall of Fame players have taken their own lives. And that's what really got people's attention. It's something's wrong. Something is, is really, really wrong that, that for people, something's happening and then we need to see what's happening here. And they finally did some research and they discovered that these players had suffered permanent brain damage and they didn't know they had it until these symptoms began to accrue years and years later after they had retired. And they have a name for it now. It's called CTE, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is what it's called. It's a progressive degenerative disease of the brain that is caused by repetitive trauma to the brain. You see, I say all that not just to inform you of what's going on with the injury policy for NFL. I want you to know that those retired football players, they trusted the safety of their brains to some foam padding and a piece of molded high-impact plastic. You see, their confidence in their helmets was misplaced, whereas ours is not. The helmet of salvation is trustworthy. We can... We can trust it to do its job. Our confidence is not based on speculations. Our confidence in our helmet is not based on tests that are done in laboratories. Our confidence is based on truth. In fact, we have 66 books of truth. That the helmet of salvation is not made out of foam and molded high impact plastic. The helmet of truth is made out of the truth of God's word. That's the building material of our helmets. Simply put, our confidence is based off of the work of Christ in the Word of Christ. That's why we can trust and have confidence in our helmet. Brothers and sisters, do not let the devil get into your head. Do not let him get into your head. Don't let him cause you to doubt your salvation. Don't let him make you discouraged. But the only way we can do that, the only way we can prevent that from ever happening is by taking up and putting on the helmet of salvation every single day. Just like the shield of faith. Don't leave home without it. Amen? All right. Let's pray and we'll have a time of response. Father, we give you thanks for this day. Thank you for the armor that you provide for every believer. I thank you for the helmet of salvation. God, and I'm aware that we may have some here this morning that don't have this armor, don't have this helmet of salvation. And the reason they don't have this helmet of salvation is because they don't have salvation. This armor, the armor of God only belongs to the people of God. But this armor of God, of God is available to all people. To receive this armor of God, to, remain, to receive this helmet of salvation, you must plus, place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You must repent of your sins and place your faith exclusively in Jesus Christ and His finished work of the cross. Father, I pray that You would touch hearts this morning. Touch hearts that You would bring conviction to those that are living in sin, that they would turn from that sin and turn back to You. We've just looked at several verses that spoke the truth that a true believer cannot lose their salvation but You will chastise us. You will uh, discipline us when we sin against You to bring us back to repent, to come back to You, to live in a way that's pleasing to You. But Father, there's also in Your Word where the Apostle Paul tells us to examine ourselves to whether we're truly in the, in the faith or not. In other words, Paul is telling us to examine our hearts. To, it's one thing to say that we're saved, but is there evidence that we're saved? Is there fruit that we're saved? Does our walk match our talk? Are we filled with the Spirit? Do we love the things that, that, that you love and hate the things that you hate? So God, I ask that you would help us examine ourselves today. And Father, for those that are here this morning that have maybe never trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior, that's the invitation for them to come. That this might be the day of salvation. That this might be the day 
that their sins can be forgiven, that they can be reconciled with you, and that they may receive the gift of everlasting life. They might receive salvation that, that, that cannot ever be taken away. We're not saved by our good works. We're not kept saved by our good works. We're saved by grace alone. And we're kept saved by grace alone. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for the helmet of salvation. God, thank you for loving us like you do. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.